80% of the ingested potassium is immediately taken up by the cells while the remaining 20% stays within the extracellular fluid space. Now, of the 80% taken up by the cells, 75% is taken up by the skeletal muscle, while the remaining 25% is taken up by the liver, red blood cells, and bones. It's also important to know that the uptake of potassium begins within minutes and is usually complete within 90 minutes. However, after 90 minutes, cells slowly release potassium over the next 10 to 12 hours. Fortunately, this cellular release of potassium is matched by the excretion of potassium by the kidneys. This synergistic relationship between the cells and the kidneys plays a central role in maintaining extracellular fluid potassium within the normal range. In summary, Short-term changes in extracellular fluid potassium are regulated by cellular uptake, while long-term changes in extracellular fluid potassium are regulated by the kidneys. Now with that in mind, let's ask the question, how is potassium taken up by the cells? The answer is, potassium ions are transported into the cell by the sodium-potassium ATPase. So, anything that inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase will lead to elevated extracellular fluid potassium, while anything that stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase will lead to decreased extracellular fluid potassium. Now that we know how potassium is taken up by the cells, what factors regulate the uptake of potassium? Well, the cellular uptake of potassium is stimulated by insulin, catecholamines, and aldosterone. Now, insulin stimulates the uptake of potassium by first binding the insulin receptor, which initiates a complex cascade of signaling molecules that leads to an increase in activity and the number of sodium-potassium ATPases. Because of this, insulin is often used to treat acute hyperkalemia. In addition to insulin, catecholamines, in particular epinephrine, stimulate the uptake of potassium. It starts as epinephrine binds beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which lead to an increase in the intracellular second messenger, cyclic AMP. This, in turn, activates a cascade of signaling molecules that leads to increased sodium-potassium ATPase activity. Also, like insulin, beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonists are often used to treat acute hyperkalemia. And finally, aldosterone stimulates the uptake of potassium. It starts when aldosterone binds the intracellular mineralocorticoid receptor. This in turn activates a cascade of signaling molecules, which in turn leads to a short-term increase in sodium-potassium ATPase activity and the number of sodium-potassium ATPases. This is followed by a long-term increase in newly synthesized sodium-potassium ATPases. Now, unlike insulin and epinephrine, aldosterone is not used to treat acute or chronic hyperkalemia. With this in mind, let's talk about how uncontrolled type 1 diabetes can lead to alterations in serum potassium. Now, uncontrolled type 1 diabetes is characterized by the inability of the pancreas to secrete insulin. This leads to increased serum potassium by two different mechanisms. First, the lack of insulin attenuates the cellular uptake of potassium, and second, the diabetic-induced ketoacidosis promotes the release of potassium from cells, both of which lead to increased extracellular fluid potassium or worse, hyperkalemia. So the question is, how does ketoacidosis lead to the release of potassium from cells? Well, to answer this question, let's frame the question in terms of pH, since ketoacidosis is associated with decreased pH. So how does pH influence the movement of potassium between the intracellular and extracellular compartments? Well, decreases in pH, which is referred to as acidosis, stimulates the release of potassium from cells in exchange for hydrogen ions. This leads to an increase in extracellular fluid potassium and a normalization of extracellular fluid pH. Conversely, increases in pH, which is referred to as alkalosis, stimulates the cellular uptake of potassium in exchange for hydrogen ions. This leads to a decrease in extracellular fluid potassium and a normalization of extracellular fluid pH. Now, the exact mechanisms of how this happens are not clear. However, it is clear that the exchange of hydrogen ions for potassium ions plays an important role in the regulation of extracellular fluid potassium and pH.